Right, I think we are good uh, to go. Uh, so welcome back. This is uh, the second in our series on the real survival skills of the 21st century. What are all of the skills that we don't tend to learn at school or even at university, even at Hartford, but which might help us uh, as we go through uh, life. And many of you will have joined us for episode one, uh, when we looked at privacy and had a great session with Carissa Belief, the Hartford Fellow who had just released Privacy is Power with Mike Waldridge, the head of the computer science department, which has since been named uh, the best in the world for the third year uh, running. And of course, with His Highness uh, Prince Zaid uh, Raad, the former UN commissioner on human rights. Today is gonna be another great one. Um, and we're gonna look at how to negotiate. What can we learn from the worlds of diplomacy and politics and business uh, and sport about the negotiations that we take part in every day this morning I was negotiating at the breakfast table, I was negotiating on the school run. I think I probably had five negotiations before I even got uh, to the office. What can we learn from these worlds of the top negotiations out there about how to negotiate uh, in real life? We've got a great uh, group of uh, participants uh, today. It's of course also the day that we've just learned that they will be refilming Ryan's Head Revisited, famously shot in Hartford, College, this is now the third remake, which I think means it's Bright said revisited, revisited. And anyone who saw the first series will understand, you'll you recall that there is the scene with Sebastian Flight uh, being, let's say, uh, uh, ill into, the, into a ground floor window. And so you'll understand that at this moment, the bursar is moving his office to the first floor in preparation uh, for that remake. So today we're gonna do negotiation and uh, I'm so glad with us, we've got three fantastic uh, people. Kathy Ashton, Baroness Kathy Ashton, um, who doesn't let us call her Baroness, uh, or indeed all her other titles, including King of Arms. She's the first woman King of Arms, but she broke an enormous amount of glass ceilings and, and has been breaking an enormous number of, of glass ceilings. Uh, but one of the very important ones was that she was the EU Vice President and High Rep of the European Union. And among many other things, negotiated uh, in the Balkans, helped to negotiate with John Kerry uh, and others, uh, the Iran deal, and so really was there at the very top tables of diplomatic uh, negotiation. Uh, so Nicholas Soames will be a very familiar ca character to many of you, uh, one of the most respected and much loved uh, MPs uh, in, in recent years in British politics. I think I'm not allowed to call him a veteran, uh, MP, but he's been around a short while, Nicholas, I think is uh, fair to say, and has seen most of the key arguments of British politics in the last couple of decades up pretty close. Uh, and finally, Adam Parr, who's with us now doing his second doctorate. Um, I'm delighted he's with us at Hartford College, um, but in a previous life uh, was not just a very successful business person, and activist, but also ran the Williams uh, Formula One team for uh, five years. So we'll hear from him what we can learn from that experience about how we negotiate in our day-to-day -day lives. So let's get straight uh, into all of that. I'm going to start with Cathy. Uh, Cathy, so you were there negotiating with the Iranians, negotiating with some of these incredibly tough characters in the Balkans uh, and the Middle East. What can you share with us about, about what you learned about how to negotiate in that role? Tom, it's wonderful to be here and to be joining uh, my dear friend, Nicholas, and to meet for the first time, uh, Adam. Um, Nietzsche, the philosopher said, the most common form of human stupidity is forgetting what you're trying to do. And in negotiations, lesson number one is be absolutely sure what it is you're actually trying to do. It sounds very simple, it sounds obvious, but you will be amazed, or maybe you wouldn't be, how often in trying to do a negotiation or lead a, a negotiation, you get buffeted around because people want to add or take away, normally add, to what you're trying to achieve. Nowhere was that more true than the Iran negotiations, where people said, well, it didn't do this and it didn't do that. No, it didn't, it did what it said on the tin. It did the issue, it dealt with the issue that was what I call the boulder in the doorway. 
that prevented us from dealing with a whole range of other issues that were incredibly important, needed to be dealt with, needed to be hopefully negotiated, but dealt with, um, but which couldn't even be begun before we dealt with the nuclear issue. And it's true in the Middle East, it's true in the negotiations I did in Serbia and Kosovo. You just have to begin by saying, what is it we're actually trying to achieve? What, kind, what that is, the pathway to it, the success criteria. As I say to people, how will you know when you've done it? Make sure that you're absolutely clear what it is and when it's done. And, and in more devastating lives now, Kathy, are you, are you a fearsome negotiator at home? I'm trying to imagine you and Peter arguing over the washing up. Uh, do you Am do I those negotiations? Of, well, I've brought up five children, set children and children. Um, and when people say to me, so what was the training you did? Well, there you go. Um, as you rightly said, Tom, and it's something you and I've talked about before, every day you negotiate, you negotiate with your kids often, you negotiate with your friends, with your, uh, with your, almost with yourself, you know, trying to work out how your day is going to work out. Everything that you do, you're in some form of negotiation or mediation. And all of those skills are often underestimated because they're soft skills. But they're incredibly important because, especially when you're dealing in the world of politics or in the world of diplomacy and the two massively overlap, it's all of those soft skills that are going to get you what you want. I was, as you know, leader of the House of Lords for a while. I never had more than 22% of the vote and I had to get the legislation through on behalf of my government. And that was all a process of negotiating of working with people, of listening to them, working out what we needed to do. And it's that whole set of skills, and you can kind of dissect them for yourself just by thinking about how did I actually get the kids in the car, do school without all hell breaking loose? Or how did I work out with my colleagues who was going to do what? And if you actually dissect them and almost write them down, what you'll find is that they are the skill set you need for a really good negotiator. I remember one American negotiator saying to me, um, you have to remember the best negotiators have two ears and one mouth, and they, they work in, in that proportion. They listen much more uh, than they speak. And I think that was certainly the, a, a big feature of the way you handled the Balkans uh, and, the, uh, and the Iran deal. Let me, let you, you've seen a lot of negotiations close up uh, in, in politics over the last couple of decades. <laughs> Who's most impressed you? Who do you think were the most effective negotiators? Well, first of all, I, <clears throat> I am a complete amateur in this talk. I mean, Cathy has in her life um, uh, had to negotiate in some of the most extraordinarily tricky and difficult fora, and she's done it brilliantly, triumphantly, actually, many would say. Um, and um, the world that I inhabited is a lowly world of politics where negotiations were often done in smoke-filled rooms, um, as much caricatured, though quite true, late at night, um, often on very big issues, actually, um, to do largely with legislation and policy. And I would say there is one man who was outstandingly the finest negotiator I've ever seen, and um, he's a little known, he won't be well known to the outside, he spent... 20 years of his life in the government whip's office, was later a minister of the foreign office, a very, very brilliant European minister. And his name was Tristan Garrel James. Garrel he was the yes. most accomplished, remarkable, extraordinary negotiator. And honestly, he, he, he wasn't a salesman in the sort of um, grubby sense of the word. He was always master of what he was trying to do. And I, I think that Cathy's absolutely right about that in you've got to be quite clear about where you want to go and how you're going to get there. And of course, how you get there and whether or not you actually get there is all part of what the negotiation is. But Tristan had a gift of taking people with vastly different views, often very heavily entrenched, uh, often entirely unreasonable, uh, and getting them to come round, not necessarily to his way of thinking, but to the way of thinking that they could reach an accommodation because all proper politics uh, is an accommodation really driven by principle. 
Uh, and I don't think I ever saw anyone as accomplished as him. He would give him any brief to do, and he would do it. And the second, I think of, of the prime ministers that I served under, I thought John Major was an extraordinary uh, brilliant negotiator. He was such a, he was such a, it wasn't that he was a consensual person because he had a, a back of steel, but he, he sought consensus as a person. And he had a very skillful way in talking people uh, around, and I don't mean by that sort of smooth talking them around, I mean just getting from A to B with people who didn't agree was in itself quite an achievement. And I think the way that he managed all that was exemplary, as he is an exemplary man. Sadly, Tristan Garrel Jones died three months ago, and we won't see his like again, really. I don't think there was anyone who was so brilliantly skilled as he was. And that's just funny. It's interesting that you, that you pick two, two people where, because of their ability to compromise, and often when we're observing politics, and particularly now with the way the media is, but it's been a while, the sort of that sense that we had in Maggie Thatcher of it, it's got to be game, set, and match. I've gone to Brussels, and I've won everything, and I've come back, and I've walloped the other side. Um, or even some people, you know, they might quote your, your grandfather was in church and say, never, never give up. And there's a sense that you shouldn't uh, compromise. And yet what both of you have said is that, that the, the best negotiators are able to, to make those, those compromises. Um, can you say a bit more about John Major's method? How would he approach a negotiation? Well, I... Look, I just think you, I I'm, I'm think you're, you're being, uh, Lady Thatcher, um, with whom I had many disagreements, um, but nevertheless, I greatly admire. I, I thought that she was, you know, when, when you said she came back and said, I, I, of course, that was her manner. It was her manner, and she handbagged a lot of them, and it was all deemed to be a tremendously good show in the British papers. But don't forget that every other foreign leader does exactly the same thing. They go back and they say to their governments, we came to the Brits, we got exactly what we want. You know, it's, it's, it's part of a very annoying, distressing game, which must have driven Cathy mad when she was in the commission. But that's part of the game. Uh, I think um, I think that John Major, John Major skills were exactly brilliantly um, defined by Cathy. They were soft skills. You know, his skills were those of approaching the problem. He, he liked people, John. He, you know, he didn't like... John, I, I almost think that he's one of the few people who had... I don't know how many political enemies John had, but it must have been very few. There were some absolute lunatics on the far right of the Tory party who hated him, but that was about it. Otherwise, he was a man who commanded extraordinary respect after a very short career in, 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 at the very highest levels of, of the British government. Um, partly because, mainly because of his soft skills, he was always ready to listen. I think that's a very good quote you gave about having two sets of ears and one mouth. I think that's, that is, in fact, an old Arab proverb. Um, uh, and and um, uh, it's a very, very good rule to abide by, and he certainly did have that. He wanted to take people with him. Now, it's not always possible to do it. Um, and, in fact, um, actually, David Cameron was a good negotiator, but he was in such a difficult position that it was never possible to concede any ground, really. Uh, John Major was always prepared to concede ground if it got him other ground that he wanted. And I just think, above all else, I think people who do this uh, are very, very clever. You cannot negotiate with people. Uh, I, I, think, I think I don't know him at all, I'm going to say hello to him, but I think John from Powell must have been a very skilled negotiator in the Northern Ireland peace talks. Uh, there are many other people who were involved in that extraordinary, um, uh, extraordinary that extraordinary experience. But peacemaking, um, deal making, bringing people together is a great, great gift and a greatly underestimated gift, in my view. We must come back to John, Tom, Kathy. Tom, just before you move on to Adam, forgive me, Adam, for interrupting, but. I just wanted to in endorse with what Nicholas said about Tristan Garrel Jones, who was one of my great friends. I used to go on holiday to his house in Spain. And I used to joke with him that his ability to get things done, he once worked very closely with me, though we were opposite parties on the Lisbon Treaty. He was what I called my conservative whip. And watching him operate uh, across the House of Lords was something else. 
He was absolutely fantastic. So I just wanted to agree completely on that. Um, incidentally, um, uh, Nick mentioned um, our negotiations with Europeans. My, my job in number 10 often entailed uh, being on the Eurostar going to Brussels with the Prime Minister and calling my French counterpart, calling the, the Conseil Diplomatique in uh, the Elysee to say, OK, we'd like to win on this thing over here. And we're, and we're briefing out that this is all that matters at this European Council. And he said, great, because we'd like to win on something completely different. So we'll brief our media that the argument is over here. And then we, we were both able to go to our press conferences and announce complete and utter victory. <laughs> Meanwhile, the more effective negotiator, Angela Merkel, quietly scored the other eight points on the agenda and didn't bother with the great kind of, I've, I've beaten the opposition uh, press conference, she just quietly uh, got on with it. Um, Attila the Hun says it's never wise to gain by battle what may be gained through bloodless negotiations. Uh, uh, so and, and, and she is amazing. I mean, I sat through five years of European councils. I visited uh, the Chancellor in Berlin uh, and she was a close ally on the uh, Iran negotiations, but also in the, in the Western Balkans. And there is nobody I've ever seen who can work a room while apparently not moving hardly at all. Yeah. Uh, and have long ago decided what she needs and what she wants to get from a discussion and bagging it. Amazing. And that ability to let other people think that they've won is a tremendous uh, skill. So, Adam, um, now we've been hearing that actually some of these soft skills, the ability to compromise and to listen, are crucial. But your, your book on, uh, on the F1 years is about, it's called The Art of War. I mean, so was it more brutal? I mean, you described it as a, as a brutal experience. I think you just on on mute, Adam. Apologies. Um, I didn't want to interrupt. That was a masterclass from from Kathy and Nicholas, um, and from you, Tom. Uh, I I feel quite humbled because I've never operated on the sort of world stage that uh, that you guys have, but I've certainly been involved in in a lot of sort of hand to hand combat in in the business world, <laughs> Formula World, and. and um, but I'm also, in a sense, studying this for my for my DPhil because one of the things that I'm very conscious of, and I think perhaps all of us have to be humbled by, is we may have had very successful negotiations in our careers, but on some very very big issues that we care passionately about, we've failed, you know, collectively, um, you know, to, to 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 win the argument, you know, and I some of us might say Brexit would be an example of that, but there'll be lots of things that have happened in the last five years in in, in say British politics where actually we've kind of lost the negotiation on quite a major scale. Um, so, so I feel I always approach this subject with quite a lot of humility and, and, the, and a reflection of the fact that if I was so good, if I understand it so well, why have I not been a bit more successful? Um, but what have I learned? So interestingly, given what um, both, both, well, all three of you have said, I, I, I love Francis Bacon's um, essay on called of negotiating and of course when he was writing in about 400 years ago negotiation wasn't what we think of it now it was life it was business it was making your way in the world so his very short essay it's like a page on of negotiating is worth um, reading and I'd just like to read you the very first things he say because he says because I think it's one of the most powerful things he says it is generally better to deal by speech than by letter so don't do negotiation by email is my first advice. Um, but more generally, I think what everyone's reflected on is that negotiation is a process, right? And it has to be understood as a process that unfolds over time, involves people, emotion. It's often not rational. And where I've been least successful is where I had the strongest arguments. And if you reflect perhaps on public affairs, it's often true that the most the strongest, most rational reasons why people should do things don't actually carry the day. What carries the day is emotion, it's trust, um, and so forth. And I think that the people I've seen who've been most effective, the Bernie Ecclestons, the Ross Brauns, people like that, in a sense, they build up non-transactional relationships over decades. And when they're negotiating, they're negotiating in a context. Now, you can't always create that because sometimes you just have to deal with people you don't know. But how do you give them a sense that you're, you're going to be there, that you're gonna fulfill your side of the deal? You know, what you say is, is, is truthful. 
Um, I think that's terrifically important. It's a process and it unfolds over time and trust and confidence versus transaction. Try not to make it transactional. Um, and I think that's a bigger issue than when whether people walk away feeling they've won. I think that's important. But even if they lose, they need to know that you're going to keep your side of the bargain, whatever that bargain is. Um, just on sort of tips, I think one of the most powerful things I've learned in business is sometimes in business, you can't compromise. For example, you're selling a product and you, you have to get the price you have to get. And very often negotiating in that context, like on price is actually counterproductive. It actually undermines people's trust. So I never go in with, with the ability to drop by 10%. I go in and say, that's the price. And I want the other side to know that if that isn't acceptable, that's fine, but we're not moving. Because once you say, okay, well, I'll give you 10%, they think, well, maybe I could have got 15%. If you are not prepared to move and they know that, they have a decision to make, but they know they're not gonna be made to look like an idiot later on. So I don't negotiate on price. And that raises a very interesting point because some of the greatest negotiators, there's a very good book by a former FBI um, negotiator. You can't compromise on hostages. You can't say, well, you kill half and I'll just take half back, <laughs> right? Um, you've got to be able to, it's called Never Split the Difference and it's a bloody good book. Um, but one last thought and then I'll, I'll sort of hand over is, um, in a negotiation, there is comes a moment where you have to do what some people will go for the no. You have to have the courage to make the other side say no, so that you understand what is required, what is going to get the deal done. So I'm trying to sell a piece of software or a sponsorship, a deal. I need to get a no because the killer is in the commercial world is a zombie yes. It's like, oh, I think that went really, really well you think you've sold something, you haven't sold anything. So go for the no and then turn the no into, okay, thank you for being clear. Now, to make that a yes, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to turn that no into a yes? Okay, technically, there'll always be three things. Technically, do, are you satisfied that my product does what you need? Okay, great. Is it the price? You know, maybe we have to talk about maybe not dropping the price, but maybe there's a discussion around how do we give you greater value, right? And then thirdly, there's the human dimension. Is it, are you worried about this in some other way? Like there's some um, internal politics in your organization that you can't sign off on this personally, but if you could convince someone else, you know, that kind of process, which is very important in a corporate environment is who is signing off? Are you talking to the right people? So. So I, going to the no kind of is a summary for me of how you bring out all of those dimensions so that you can deal with them. So that would be my, you know, that's going from Francis Bacon to going for the no, but it's my kind of, I guess my, my approach. May I, may, 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 may I be allowed one more thing? Apologies. I am not a very good negotiator, but I'm bloody good at planning and setting them up and preparing. So I have a business partner he is brilliant. He and I worked together for five years in Formula One. He is the most brilliant negotiator because he does exactly what he plans to do. He never errs. So if he says, I have one last point, he doesn't do what I just did and have two last points. If he says, I have one last point, he has one last point. Sam is a brilliant negotiator. So I always prep with him and then he does the negotiation because I know my weaknesses. Well, I hope, I hope that if Donald Trump is watching that he heard your point about um, if you lose, you have to keep your side uh, of the bargain. Can I just come in on your point about trust? So trust is the currency here, and it flows through what we discussed about Tristan Gower Jones, about the negotiations Cathy has done, John Major building up that trust, Angela Merkel working the room and building up trust. Um, so trust is that currency, Adam. How, how do you, so if you're a student now and you're thinking about how to negotiate with your tutor about an essay extension, for example, what are the things you can be doing in day-to-day -day life to build up that trust so that when the transaction comes, it doesn't feel like such a win-lose transaction? Well, I think, um, again, it, you can't build up trust by trying to build up trust, right? You've got to sort of, I think it's in how you deal with people in everything you do, every little detail. So what can you do to help people out 
Um, when people need a favor, you will go to the ends of the earth to do something for them. Um, you know, oftentimes, and I'm sure that Kathy and, and Nicholas have this as well, you're asked to meet someone, you're introduced to someone, you think, really, I haven't got time for this. You're not doing it for yourself. You're not even doing it for the person who you're being introduced to. You're doing it for the person who made the introduction. So it's always about building a network, building that those relationships over time. I, the thing I learned, I mean, Frank Williams always used to say, um, you know, what goes around comes around. In the world of Formula One, you, 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 do, you do a bad turn to someone, you're never going to recover from that ever, right? Because it's such a small world. But the world may be very big, but it's always like that. I, we have friends in common. I have never met Kathy before, but we know people in common. Tom, you and I know people in common. It's a small world. So, so just bear that in mind. <laughs> yeah. Does that apply to you, Kathy, in your experience? You've dealt with some people that most of us would find very difficult to, to sit down with. Um, and how do you, how do you, how did you build up trust uh, with yeah, someone like the Foreign Minister of Iran, uh, David Zarif? So I think it, well, I wanted to say something first about about compromise because I don't, I don't, I think we have to be really careful about how we use the word. Um, and it goes back to what Adam was saying about the, you know, the FBI uh, negotiator who wrote the book and talked about hostages, that. Compromise is not about moving from your position um, because if you're in a negotiation, certainly the ones I've been involved in, you can't move from your position. You have to get what you need to get. Um, and I'll say something more about what I described as a jigsaw puzzle of what that can be. But it is really important not to think uh, that compromise is about well, I'll start here, you start there, and we'll all we'll move back from those positions. It's not that. It's much more to do with how you use the process and what you're able to give as well as what you need to get. So it's much more around how the agreement comes together. And I say that from a perspective that if at the end of the day, one of the parties is simply ground into the, the dust and forced to capitulate, well, history is littered with what happens next, which is, it doesn't last. Uh, there is resentment that turns into something that can be much, much worse. Um, the but on trust, the and, well, exactly, the, almost, the biggest and best example is the Treaty of Versailles, World War I. Um, but there are plenty of others that you'll all know of that, uh, that show that actually, if people can go home and sell the deal that they've made as a thing that is good, is positive, you know, they've had to give some things, but look what they got and so on, it is much, much more likely to survive and you are much more likely to be able to build on it. On trust, um, it's, it's about, for me, trust in my being willing and able to do what I can, but being absolutely clear what I cannot do. So in my negotiations with people who by definition, if you take the negotiations between Serbia and Kosovo, these were with people who, if they'd ever seen each other before, it was across a battlefield and their relatives and friends were dead as a consequence. It was deeply held resentments and hatreds or with uh, Iran, it was years and years of terrible relationships and a deep and abiding fear on many countries that Iran had uh, was trying to build a nuclear weapon and the consequences that that would be for a region that we all know well. So they're not people that you are meeting in a context where you can spend time building a relationship to begin with before you're in the the, the, the heart of a negotiation with them. It's the negotiation of the, the relationship, if you like. You get to know them because you're spending so much time negotiating with them. So the trust comes from that you're not out to surprise them. You're not out to tell them stuff that, you know, you don't show all your cards. So I used to talk about put your cards in your back pocket and know what you're going to play at any given time. But you're not 
actually trying to do something that's going to mislead them or persuade them of something that you then cannot deliver. So I would always say, if I tell you I can't deliver it, I can't deliver it. If I say we can look at it, we can look at it. And if I say that's possible, it's possible. Because I'll never do it unless I'm 100% confident of that. So trust, for me, in the kind of negotiations I've been involved in, is about them knowing that what you say you'll do, you'll do. And what you say you cannot do, you cannot do. Isn't this now all much harder in the age of uh, social media and Twitter? I mean, Cathy, you managed to keep the Iran negotiations pretty secret most of the time. You weren't live tweeting the conversations with Zarif uh, and others. And this particularly applies, I mean, Nick mentioned Jonathan Powell. Much of Jonathan Powell's most effective diplomacy was in secret behind the scenes. Much of John Major's most effective diplomacy on Northern Ireland was at a time when his immediate had heard quite how developed the conversation was with Sinn Féin, they have blown the whole thing uh, out of the water. So how do we how do we build that sort of trust in a in a media arrangement? And just while I've got Nicholas, I'd also like to check. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about engaging the other side. With the, the most stupid minute ever written by Tim Downing Street in the last twenty years said, "We should never negotiate with anyone with blood on their hands." Now I know that because I wrote that minute, and then I then went off to Lebanon. And most of my job was negotiating with warlords who had blood on their hands. You know, if, if I refused to negotiate, I might have got nothing uh, done. So how do we how do we talk to the bad guys? I mean, is it is it right that we do sit down with terrorists? Uh, I don't mention hostage takers uh, and negotiate with them. So that's a two two questions mixed up. You can take it any way you want. Think. Well, of course, it, of course, it's right uh, if it means. Um, the saving of life and the national interest and and all the rules that countries have. We won't negotiate on X, Y, or Z, of course, is an immutable thing. I, I just want to sort of say one thing. To, to, I'm under no delusions about my position in this talk. I mean, trapped between Adam and Cathy, my negotiations were extremely mundane. My negotiations at their highest point was, was receiving a delegation of furious trade unionists uh, about closing a lot of airfields, which I had to do when I was a defense minister. And they had a perfectly good argument and, and against the wishes of my uh, uh, officials, uh, I, I saw them and I asked them to come to tea at the Ministry of Defense. And I just think that the point that Adam made about never negotiate, you know, by email is, is 100% correct. You have to, if you're serious about it, you have to do it eye to eye, decently, respectfully, uh, trying to get what you want, <clears throat> but at least allowing someone else who at the end of the day, in my case, was always going to come out on the wrong end of the argument because whatever the consultation happened, we were going to close these airfields. But the, they had a very important thing to say to me, which was about the rights that their, uh, uh, their fellow union members had in these negotiations. And of course, we honored and protected those rights. But they, I think part of negotiating is, is, is actually satisfying people's need to be heard and to be dealt with on a proper basis. Now, Cathy has had to spend her life, as you have, Tom, negotiating with some very, very bad people indeed. Um, and, and you, emer you emerge, both of you, in each case, pretty much, with an extraordinary result. But my God, the, the, the difficulty and the, and the thing of taking people with you and all the rest of it is, is very, is very common. Well, the sort of thing that Adam is talking about um, is mainly, I imagine, a commercial transaction. But there's no reason why it shouldn't be done in a respectful manner, as long as everyone knows what the rules are at the beginning and the end. And I think his point about, you know, um, if you say this is my last offer, you mean it is my last offer and that's it. And you need to have a reputation for doing that. So I think that I, to the answer to your question is that uh, the only way you can do it is by, but you can only build trust face to face. You cannot build trust at the end of an email. You have to sit down. I mean, I remember, Cathy, I don't know um, whether you were actually involved in, the, were you in the Dayton um, yep. we, was the Dayton thing when 
So it was just before you got there, I think. But the, the Dayton talks, uh, which were, in my, I had no part of them at all, and being on the receiving end of the results, um, uh, was a quite astonishing uh, marathon run, which went on for months and months and months and months with people who simply weren't prepared to agree. But finally, the, the trust and the understanding grew between the people involved in these talks and their governments, and an agreement was finally made, albeit at the end of a very large sledgehammer. But it was, it was an agreement and it did stick. So I don't think there's anything that's beyond an agreement, as long as the people who are doing it are sufficiently skilled and versed. So that's why negotiators in the main, except for like Kathy was um, thrown into the Iran negotiation, but the actual people who do the nuts and bolts and the writing of the stuff are tremendous professionals. I think Kathy would agree that a lot of the time you're flying by the seat of your skirt, frankly. We all are. You have no idea what's going to happen next. It, uh, it takes some, yeah. George, George Mitchell says that negotiation is 799 days of failure before one day of success. Correct. Sorry. Yeah. I, I mean, just to pick up that, I mean, Dayton was, of course, the, the, the uh, negotiations in an Ohio airbase to yeah. try and resolve the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And uh, Richard Holbrook was the American guy. I, I got to know Richard very well before he died. Um, and, you know, he was the kind of guy who, could, who I could never say no to because Richard would approach everything from the position that you were going to achieve this, whatever impossible task he'd given you. And so I could see him with the uh, recalcitrant and extremely difficult challenge uh, lead with the leaders uh, uh, that he had to negotiate with very successfully. But back to but your point, Tom, you know, you don't negotiate with your friends. That's the whole point. You are by definition negotiating with people because you're trying to stop something happening or you're trying to stop something that is already happening and find a way through it. And it is often um, lonely. It's often long term. I spent four and a half years on the Iran negotiations. Uh, it is often extremely challenging. And as the wonderful George Mitchell would say, absolutely right. You do not know if you're going to succeed or not. Most of the time, you think you're not. I can I can show you notes I wrote with the negotiations of Serbia Kosovo with with Iran, where I was convinced we were not going to make it because we just couldn't find a way through in a very in very particular months. And of course, I negotiated on the Russia Ukraine crisis, and I negotiated in Egypt, and we didn't succeed. You know, there were plenty of negotiations where you can't find. The, the formula, the thing that's going to unlock the final pieces that will actually bring you at that moment to a conclusion that's satisfactory. Can I just check in with you, Cathy, uh, on, the, on the social media media point, when you're trying to negotiate, you know, effectively with that media barrage, you being an extra negotiator. And I have a question then from Adam that's coming from one of our um, uh, uh, allies. So Cathy, on the, on the media point. So, um, one of the things I always tell people is that you have to create space to be able to have negotiations because at any given moment, if, it, if you have a discussion out in public, it's going to be un uneven because you're always in the middle of, well, you may have made an offer or they may have not responded or vice versa. It will not be uh, a conclusive moment. I made a commitment in the Serbia-Kosovo agreement that I would do at the end of each round, a short paragraph to camera that they would agree every word and every comma. And I would say that paragraph and nothing more. And I agreed in the Iran negotiations that I would say nothing. There were hundreds, I mean, hundreds of journalists who followed us all over the world in the early negotiations and then eventually to Geneva and Vienna, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of them, who I felt very sorry for because we, I certainly said nothing. But the agreement I had was that although others would do proper briefings out to their own journalists, particularly the US team, because that was part of what they needed to do in order to keep people in Congress and elsewhere conscious of what they were doing, I never said anything. 
And that meant that all of the conversations I had, there could be a confidence that they would stay in the room, which they did. Um, so there's a question from Amanda, which I, I think actually applies to everyone, but sort of about intelligence gathering. And going to Adam, like, how did you, as a Formula One team, if you were effectively competing with the other teams, uh, sometimes you'd be negotiating, but sometimes it was a straight up competition. How did you gather intelligence and information before going into those uh, competitions, before going into those negotiations with uh, the likes of Ferrari? Well, <laughs> there's quite a funny story, which is, um, on the most technical basis, that we all had um, uh, photographers who used to go through the garages and try and take pictures of everyone else's rear wings and whatever. But ironically, to save money, we all use, we all use the same cameraman. So the guy basically used to walk around and take pictures of all of us for all of us. And it was just more economic that way. So um, that was one form of intelligence. In terms of what the, the bizarre thing, and I think it's probably a little bit like uh, what both uh, Kathy and Nicholas have sort of described and you've experienced on, which is where you're negotiating over a period of time with the same people. If you're doing a negotiation for four and a half years, you're probably staying in the same hotels, maybe even having dinner with people. In course, in Formula One, you travel around the world, you, you share cars and helicopters and planes, and you stay in the same hotels and you get to know the people you're competing with extremely well. I mean, some of them, I mean, in my case for five years, but someone like Frank and Ron Dennis were, were doing that for, for decades. Um, so the funny thing is, though, that Bernie Eccleston, who's probably one of the most talented deal makers, you know, probably ever I mean, in, in, a, in a sort of commercial world, I mean, extraordinarily talented. He only ever did one thing, which was divide and rule. And, um, and he did it exactly the same thing every single time. And it always worked. And I learned something from him, which is the tricky thing is, you know, Sun Tzu said, you know, know your enemy and know yourself and you will never lose in a battle, right? Um, you'll never lose a battle. The trickiest thing is, do you know yourself and do you know the other person? But I, I don't think it's very difficult to, in, in, to understand to, the, the intelligence side of things isn't necessarily very difficult. What's difficult is to convince yourself that what you see is kind of true to be to see clearly and then to act on it. So the problem with Bernie is that everybody knew what he would do and he always did it, but people would convince themselves that he would, they were different. And what Bernie used to do, and he was so charming, so obviously still going at nearly, nearly 90, 90 last month, I think, you know, he'd, he'd say, he'd put his hand on your knee and he'd say, Adam, what we need to do is this. And by the end of that conversation, you'd do anything that he wanted. He was just so charming and you thought he really trusts me. He wants my opinion. And, you know, whatever I've thought about him in the past, this is different. And of course it wasn't different at all. And off we go. So, so my point is not is so much that it is more, it's not about intelligence gathering. It's about being sort of really understanding what's going on and being utterly realistic about yourself, your vanity, your ego. I thought I was so bloody clever and so bloody articulate, and he just absolutely eviscerated me. That's the truth. Excellent, thank you. Um, I've got another question here from Matt, who did uh, uh, physics in 1971 at Harvard. And this is about, what, what do you do when you're negotiating with someone who won't give any ground at all? Uh, let's maybe uh, go to Kathy, perhaps a reference to uh, Donald Trump not leaving office. How would you try to convince someone he won't give you any ground. I'm sure you've negotiated from many people where there's been no no chance of any compromise. What's your tactic in that situation? I think it, it depends. I mean, you, you have to begin any negotiation with the willingness to walk away. And so, you know, lesson number one, if somebody says, well, I'm not doing that or I'm not interested, don't waste your time, walk away. Most people, by definition, if you even get into the same room, they usually want or need something from you and they're looking for something that they can do to get it. So it's, it's, it's almost, it's very human to want to open the conversation and to actually try and find a way through. Um, when you're dealing with people who um, are 
trying to suggest that they're never going to give anything. You know, there's no part. I mean, all of my negotiations have begun with people saying, no, I'm not doing that. Whatever it is you want, forget it. It's never going to happen. But the fact you're in the room means it, you know, that's not what's going to be the case. So you just have to spend some time. Um, and as Adam says, you spend a lot of time with people in negotiations uh, because you know, you're working with them in a very close environment. You get to know them, as I would describe it, because you simply can't, I would, if I was spending four or five hours one-on-one -on -one in a negotiation, you just can't talk about centrifuges or you just can't talk about, um, you know, specific issues for that length of time. You, you tend to wander off at some point into something else. And it, and it will probably be something like, I like that carpet, or this looks interesting, or did you, you know, what do you, what do, you do when you're not doing this? So there's a kind of human element to it, because it's the humanness of it that will get you there. It's a fact that in the end, not that you, you um, have empathy or sympathy necessarily, but that the human nature and the way that you've worked together you'll start to be able to pick up the glimmers of light or the things that you can latch onto that just prise the door open a little bit more and get you maybe through it. Is that I, sorry, I do, sorry, I do, I do think there's um, um, one particular thing, um, Cathy, is that you were dealing uh, with matters of life and death uh, between nations. Uh, and I think what Adam said is very um, apposite. You know, the fact is that in, in, in as what I call private sector, not public, you know, a personality can go a very, very long way. So, for example, his, his, um, his uh, thing about being um, rolled over completely by Bernie Eggleston is, is just because Bernie Eggleston is such a figure, such an amazing extraordinary, remarkable man for generations. Uh, I worked for a businessman called Jimmy Goldsmith for two years, who I was very, very fond of, but he was an absolutely astonishing man. He could walk into a room full of a hundred people who absolutely loathed him. And within five minutes, they were all eating out of his hand because what he said was so compelling and his personality was so huge. and The story was so marvelous. And you can't do that in the sort of negotiation that you're talking about, Cathy. It's just inch by inch, hour by hour, day by day, incremental loss for incremental gain. And then along comes Richard Holbrook, who literally beats the Serbs into submission, literally through just sheer aggro that went on for months and months behind an Air Force base, which they weren't allowed to leave. But a lot of that agreement was reached on the basis of Holbrook's personality on the one hand, in my view, and the circumstances of what the talks took place on the other. Yours in Iran, there was no known, no known possible previously known outcome to those talks. So it was an extraordinary achievement. And these are all very different. So, you know, um, yeah, sorry, Adam, was I right? No, 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 I was gonna, I was gonna reinforce that and I, um, Sorry, Tom, I, did I interrupt? Because you made me... Well, I think um, there's a very interesting point here, which is that, um, as Cathy said, if people are in a room, it's because they want to talk, right? Or they have to talk. I would like to make two other points, which is the first one is that when you go from public to private, there is a very different, it's a, it's a, it's a very different sort of game, isn't it? Um, but um, the, the thing that strikes me about the world today from a public point of view, is that in a sense, the very big negotiations are one where one side wants to find a solution and the other one wants to buy time. And success for them is just keeping talking. And that's, I feel like some of the negotiations we've talked about in the nineties and beyond and before were kind of more symmetrical and both parties wanted a solution. But on things like climate, there are plenty of people who just want to go to COP26 and COP27 and COP28 and keep talking. Because while they're talking, they're yeah. doing what the hell they were doing before. And so yeah. I'm more worried about people who, who, who are going in sort of bad faith to just keep negotiating than actually want to, to change things. May I make one last point, as I like to do? Um, it's fascinating to me when we talk about business versus 
public sector, business people like me have to be super humble about public service because our skills are not necessarily transferable. And there's this guy who is famous for what he called the art of the deal, right? He did a book called The Art of the Deal. And the implication of the art of the deal is that he was a great negotiator, a great deal maker. What has been fascinating about the last four years is that he hasn't actually done a deal with anybody on anything. And what he's, I'm not saying he's not achieved anything at all, but what he has achieved is by executive order or by just the sheer power of office. But if you look at negotiation, the one thing he has not done is negotiated with anything, anybody on anything with any success. And ultimately, that's probably why he's not going to be in office for much longer is, you know, he actually isn't a negotiator. Um, and he may be a very successful businessman, but he he's not, not into <laughs> I'm being generous. But my point is, yeah. even if you regard him as a very successful businessman, he has not taken the art of the deal into the public sector. And many people in business are like that. We don't translate easily. Absolutely. Um, there's so much um, quality stuff in there. And certainly when, when Holbrook was negotiating at Dayton, there was one dinner that he actually handled the meeting beneath the plane itself that would have been bombing his, uh, his uh, interlocutor in the, in the conversation. Too. Yeah. So, it was, you know, it's, it's probably not an option that students have when they're negotiating for an extension to their, uh, their deadline, but it just shows you can, you can be creative in a negotiation. On the, on the glimmer of light, on Cathy's glimmer of light and patience, um, I had one moment when negotiating between Sinn Féin uh, and the Unionists in Northern Ireland when one of the Unionist interlocutors, uh, because he'd lost a family member to an IRA, IRA bomb, refused to actually face uh, Martin McGuinness uh, in the room. Um, and the negotiation was very, very difficult because he literally turned his chair away so as not to, not to be facing him. Um, and, we, and we had days and days of this just not going uh, anywhere until that glimmer of light moment. In this case, it's a very human connection. Um, one of those present lost a family member. And we said, you know, you must go and be with them for the, the funeral. And they said, no, it's more important that we're here in this room for this negotiation. And at that point, mm -hmm. he turned the chair around and rejoined the conversation. And it was that, that moment, you're waiting that moment of magic really, when finally you think there's some trust back in this room, back in this process. I've got one more question from James, because we're about to, to run out of time. I, I could go for, Hours, but every negotiation needs to be well scaffolded. Uh, one question uh, from James, which is inevitably about Brexit, and I thought we'd get all the way through the hour without doing Brexit. So I'm going to put this one to Nicholas, I think. Um, what would you have done differently in the Brexit negotiations to have got a more successful outcome? Well, I'd have made sure Britain didn't leave the European Union. That's the first thing I'd have done. <laughs> Um, and we, we uh, you know, we're about to pick up all the pieces. And um, uh, I think we find ourselves in a very, very difficult place. And uh, anyway, that's not what the question was. But the question was that I really think we start, you know, it's, it's, it's like the answer to, to the Irish question. I wouldn't go from here. If I was going there, I wouldn't start from here. Um, I think we got ourselves into a position which we was needless. I, I understand very well David Cameron's great difficulties at the time, but personally, I think there was no need to have that referendum. Personally, I think you could have seen it through. He had, he had a good majority. He didn't need to do it. He'd have had, he was having a particularly bloody time in Parliament, but you, you know, you, he, you, we should have soldiered on. Uh, and I think it's, that, that is really the, the true answer to it. I wouldn't, I don't think, I, well, I would have done all that I possibly could not to have had that referendum. And had I, and, and the other thing that I would have done, and I think it's very important, I think the saddest thing about our exit from Europe is that my father, who was the British ambassador in Paris, um, who, whose job it was to try to get the girl to drop his, his um, on Britain joining the European Union, in which he succeeded in doing, um, always said to me that the trouble was that it was the fault of the generation of the Europeans who took Britain into Europe, that once we were in Europe, it became part of our sort of national thing. We were members of the European Union, but nobody, nobody ever, except for once a year, one or two people, made a speech or took the trouble to make the case for why Britain 
was an important, it was so important to Britain to be in the European Union and to be a leading member of the European Union. No one did it. And I, I, I remember being desperate in the 90s, um, you know, that people like Michael Heseltine and John Major, who did his very best, to, but we did it too late. And those who opposed Britain's entry of the European Union never, ever, ever gave up. They never gave up. From the moment we started the negotiations to enter to the moment right now when they saw us out, they never gave up. And, and you know, I think it's a sort of sad reflection on the sort of apathy of one particular sector of British public life that it didn't make the case for Europe in a far more vigorous and open manner. And I'm afraid everyone's going to suffer as a result of it. There we go. So this has been uh, a brilliant session. I'm going to come back to Cathy in just a moment for the last word, because one of our future sessions, Cathy, will be on how to break glass ceilings. And I feel that I can't ask you back a second time. So I'm going to ask you just to say something very brief on that. But first, just to round up on negotiation, some of the things that we've heard today, which may help us all um, next time we're trying to get out of going to Ikea or extend that essay uh, deadline or have an extra slice of apple pie. Some of the things we can do is try to build trust. We need to be patient often to take time to come through the negotiation, to let the negotiation play through its natural rhythm. We need to listen uh, much more. We need to know when to give our opponents uh, a ladder to climb down. Uh, it's not, it doesn't always work to, to win uh, all the time, to be seen to win all the time. We can be more creative in finding a way through the negotiation. We have to soak up the pressure uh, and, and be patient. Again, take time. You need to do your homework. Several times this came up. You need to really understand your interests, but also understand the interests of the other person in the negotiation. And then try to set some sort of uh, common uh, vision uh, for somewhere you want to get to. What is the light at the end of the tunnel so that you can then wait for that magical moment that Cathy described when you make the breakthrough. And then finally, uh, as we've touched on a number of times, you also have to know when to, when to give up uh, and to walk away and simply agree that you will go to Ikea on Saturday morning uh, rather than going for uh, a run. Now, I'm going to come back to, to Cathy to close us out on how to bust through glass ceilings, but just one final story on negotiation, which is when I was applying for this role um, in, in one of the many negotiations with the governing body uh, over it, they said, well, have you any experience of negotiation? And I said, well, I have negotiated with the IRA and Hezbollah, um, so I hope that gives me some sort of preparation for handling governing body. And there was tumbleweed through the room, and someone said, I, I think you'll find this is altogether different to handling Hezbollah. <laughs> and uh, I can confirm that it certainly is. But anyway, for the last words, uh, Cathy, um, how do we break through the glass ceilings? Well, I think, you know, every generation of women have to be determined to find ways to prove that they are capable of doing any role and they need lots of men to help them in the sense that this is a joint enterprise. As you know, I've always thought it's ridiculous that any society conceivably think that they can be successful while they're failing to use effectively 50% of the talent. It doesn't make any sense. And so for all the women, for all the brilliant writers, poets, scientists, chief executives, driving you know, cars on Formula One, leading in parliament, running countries and so on, all of that talent that we've missed for hundreds and hundreds of years, it's beholden on men and women to make sure we don't forget to ensure that women have the same opportunities as men. And a final thought on it. We talk a lot about firsts and I've achieved a lot of firsts in my life. First woman to go to university, first woman to parole parliament, in fact, first woman chancellor of Warwick University now, first king of arms, first British woman to be sent to Brussels, first trade commissioner as a woman, first high representative as a woman, all of those firsts. But what really matters to me is that there's a second. Because if I'm an aberration, then what's the point? If I'm a token, what's the point? So for me, 
the fact that my daughter went to university, my colleague Jan Royal was the second woman to prorogue parliament, that following me as a trade commissioner was Cecilia Malmstrom as another woman, that the next high representative was another woman. We'll wait and see what happens as Chancellor of Warwick University, because I'm still there. But it always matters to me that there is a second, not so that it becomes a woman's job, and that's all that you get, you know, always women, but so that there can be no doubt that it's to do with ability and not tokenism or aberration. So let's celebrate the second as well as the first. Brilliant. Um, uh, so that, that actually is as good as two hours on breaking glass ceilings. You've got it just there and there for us, it condensed beautifully. Um, this has been a really uh, fantastic session. Um, thank you very much to the three of you, uh, Cathy, Adam, Nick, for your time and your and your wisdom and your willingness to, to join us. Thank you to everyone who's dialed in for it or who, uh, who will watch um, later on. Please join us again later this month when we'll be, the next one is going to be how to be global. I'm sure the three of you could talk about how to be global as well, but you've been more than generous with us uh, already. So thank you very much indeed uh, and see you all in person uh, as soon as we're on the other side of this uh, lockdown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.